tend to be connectors, right? What does that mean, connectors? You are people who build connections from your organization to other organizations, other businesses, and other communities. Most importantly, you build connections to other people, people to people. People like you who show up, people like you who care, people like you who contribute to something greater than yourselves, and hopefully that's why you're here. You connect for the sake of moving yourself forward, your family forward, but everyone forward, including the community. These connections you make regularly, and the connections you make today, they weave a fabric, a fabric of community that strengthens businesses and organizations, and also strengthens our collective Metro South regional economy. We are delighted to be here in Bridgewater to shine a light on the extraordinary community that we know the town of Bridgewater is. As you can see, we have a full house today. I want to thank the many businesses and organizations that purchased the table of eight. And I know you're thinking, well, when I showed up, there were 10 seats at my table. And why is that? Uh, it, it's because people wanted to be here today. We had way more people than we thought we would get. And we're delighted that that is the case. It's a, ple it's a pleasure to know just how many people really wanted to be here and to learn more about Bridgewater's present and future. So many people, in fact, that we turned away uh, 12 people uh, who were put on a waiting list. Fortunately, we knew this room would be filled with community-minded connectors, and the opportunity to create more connections uh, would be welcomed by the people who bought tables of 10. So thank you for being connectors, for making uh, the room, and for your leadership uh, in the community. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney, uh, President of Metro South Chamber of Commerce, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a special Bridgewater-themed edition of Good Day Metro South. As many of you know, the Chamber holds these programs regularly. It is a terrific opportunity to come together, reconnect with others, and to learn from interesting leaders in a variety of fields. We have a very exciting lineup for today's program, which includes a presentation by the new Community and Economic Development Director, Bob Rooley. We are also very pleased to have a fantastic panel of industry and community leaders, which we will hear from later in the program. I would now like to acknowledge some chamber staff who are instrumental in pulling this program together. Please join me in a round of applause for Catherine Schofield. And Emma, Emma Stratton, in the back there. We do a lot with just a few staff, full-time staff at the chamber. We are delighted with the work they do at the chamber and thank them for their hard work on behalf of the business community. Sadly, Catherine has decided to pursue other interests, and this will be her last meeting, her last event. So uh, we wish you the very best, Catherine, in your new and future endeavors. Thank you. Some of you have met, already met Catherine's replacement, a recent honors graduate from the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, who majored in economics and also holds minor degrees in finance and Portuguese. Naldo Cardoza is a standout student. Uh, the Dean of the Economics Department said so he's in the top 1% uh, of the students that she has instructed. Uh, he shows up, he cares, and he's smart. Very, very smart. And we're happy to have him. Let's have him a round of applause for Naldo. I also want to thank so many of the companies and organizations who have tables here today, including the Old Colony Planning Council, Mass White Community College, Bridgewater Business Association, I know Bank of America, Rockland Trust, and many other banks are here, several financial institutions who are well positioned to provide financing for the future development and growth of the town of Bridgewater. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for all of them coming here today. We have a very full program, so please enjoy your lunch as we continue with the agenda. We know you're eating, we're going to be talking while you're eating, that's all fine with us. At this time, I would like to remind you that there are green Q&A forms in the middle of your table. Uh, those are for the panelist speakers. If you have a question, please just write it out, hold it up, and an ambassador, a chamber ambassador, or a chamber staff person will grab it from you, and we'll put it into the queue. We'll ask them as time allows. It is now my pleasure to introduce our MC for today. Please join me in welcoming the Chairman of the Chambers Board of Directors and President of Barber Corporation. Let me tell you a little bit about Barber Corporation. It's operated in Brockton for well over 100 years and now has locations in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, they've been uh, in business and manufacturing shoe welting, retail shelving components, rub rail for boats, and plastic extrusions. Please 
welcome Rich Hines. Rich. Thank you, Bert. I'd like to start by uh, welcoming you uh, all here at Old Scotland Links. Uh, that's a golf club on this nice, fine day. And uh, we're actually gonna, we're gonna name this Pre-Hurricane Lee Day. Okay, so we're gonna put part of that. Let's have a round of applause for Allison Charbonneau and all the staff here at Old Scotland Links. They put on a wonderful meal. And I also want to thank our Chamber of Ambassadors who helped greet you today. Mary Jane Aneen, Combined Charts of America. Mary L. Baker, HR Alternatives. Brenda Karen, Old Colony Elder Services. Richard Hook, SCU Credit Union. Catherine Knight, Eastern Bank. Joanne Schneider, Eastern Bank. Felicita Sopoveta, Cape Verdean Association of Brockton. I'd also like to thank our Chamber Board members that are in attendance today. Fred Clark, Bridgewater State University. <laughs> Mike Lambert, Brockton Area Transit Authority. <laughs> Ray De Pasquale, Massachusetts Community College. <laughs> and Ray Ledoux, former board member and chairman and uh, also a former leader of the uh, Transit Authority here, too. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank the selected and state officials for their attendance today. City of Brockton, Mayor Robert Sullivan. <laughs> yep, I, don't see, I don't see Robert here yet, but he'll be here, I'm sure. Troy Clarkson, City of Brockton, CFO. Michael Dutton, Town of Bridgewater, Town Manager. <laughs> Shane O'Brien, Town of Bridgewater, Town Planner. <laughs> Merrilee Hunt, Town of Bridgewater, Town Clerk. <laughs> Fred Chase, Town of Bridgewater, Counselor at Large. Brad McKinnon, Town of Bridgewater, Council at Large. Mark Lindy, Town of Bridgewater, Town Councilor. Diane Darling of the U.S. Small Business Administration. Did I miss anyone? Oh. Susie Robinson, Town of Bridgewater. Today's Good, Good Day Metro South program is sponsored by Rockland Trust. Founded over 115 years ago by local business owners as a bank made for business, Rockland Trust has a long heritage of innovation and customer focus. Rockland Trust was re recently recognized by the Small Business Administration as the number one lender to minority entrepreneurs in Massachusetts. In addition, the bank received an outstanding rating in its most recent Community Reinvestment Act performance evaluation. At this time, I'd like to introduce our interviewer for today's program, Attorney Masa Kambabe of Kambabe Immigration Law. And Masa is going to interview our sponsor, Grant Nick Nickerson, Vice President and Commercial Loan Officer of the Rockland Trust Company, for a brief interview. sponsoring today's event, we really appreciate that. So for those here who are not familiar with Rockland Trust or you, we'd love to hear a little bit about uh, both of you. Thank you, Masa, and uh, thank you to the Metro South Chamber and Old Scotland Lanes for hosting us here today. Um, a lot of familiar faces in the room, but some not so familiar. If you don't know me, my name is Grant Nickerson. I've been in banking almost 20 years, the last seven of which have been in the commercial banking side uh, out of Brockton. 
Um, <clears throat> Rockland Trust, as, as Rich was kind enough to uh, I'll mention, was founded 115 years ago by business owners, much like those in the room here today. And um, you know, we have a full service bank, we offer commercial banking and retail banking, business banking, uh, investment management, treasury management, insurance, the whole shebang. So, um, you know, I'm just really pleased to be here and uh, uh, look forward to the event. Thank you. So it's been, let's say, uncertain times in the banking industry and in the economy as a whole. How is the bank weathering this and looking forward, planning on dealing with any uh, disruptions? Yeah, you're right. A um, little bit crazy last couple of years. Um, if you allow me to geek out a little bit on uh, banking, everybody's favorite topic. Uh, how did we get here? Um, so we run away inflation. Everybody knows about that. Came from a combination of uh, four stimulus packages, some of which was certainly needed, some of which you know, maybe wasn't. Uh, adding to that was a this long period of low interest rates, which drove uh, property prices high. So you had a lot of property owners and when they were looking at 3% interest rates, they did cash out refinance. So cash was everywhere in the economy, including on banks' balance sheets. And so any uh, uh, sensible bank would uh, certainly invest that uh, to get some return. Typically that's loans, um, but as interest rates are coming up, banks are realizing, gee, you know, we can't make loans quick enough uh, to, to, to get a return on all this cash. So. Um, they invested in uh, risk-free uh, assets like treasuries, federal treasuries. So in the meantime, the uh, Federal uh, Reserve, as a way of addressing the inflation, which they typically do, they hiked interest rates. I personally thought they'd do sort of a measured approach. Uh, raise rates, wait a couple months, maybe raise a little more, but they went full term. Uh, 11 uh, hikes over 17 months, some 50 basis points, some 75 basis points. So all this happened pretty quick. Uh, the banks that invested in treasuries found a few months later, all of a sudden, those treasuries were worth less than the same asset at the time. So they have all these unrealized losses, which you've probably heard about. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the, the concern there then would be, um, what happens if the customer wants to take their cash out? Um, if the bank can't. Uh, provide the cash to the, the borrower that wants to make a withdrawal, they're not a real bank, and uh, so you know, it's just not sustainable. So with all these unrealized losses, some banks, notably Silicon Valley, had to uh, uh, liquidate some of those securities, recognize the losses, blew a whole hole in the balance sheet. And then of course, Signature uh, Bank, uh, First Republic, those are all, all over the news, and a number of other banks were also teetering. So. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's trouble. And um, a bank like us, Rock and Trust, uh, certainly we would have, we made some investments, but not to the extent many others did. Uh, so we're still making loans. And um, one uh, good example, uh, I would say, well, actually, let me back up. What are we making loans for? Less so are we making investment real estate loans. Because even when rates were uh, at 3%, an 80% loan on the property just wasn't, couldn't sustain the cash flow because um, the market rents weren't there. So nowadays at 7%, there's even less opportunity for those type of loans. So we're seeing um, operating companies, commercial, industrial uh, businesses still have financing needs. We're seeing um, uh, wholesalers, retailers, um, 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 distributors, and so on uh, that are. Uh, taking out loans for equipment, working capital, even business acquisitions. One quick example of what we like to do is uh, one of my, my very best customers, I'd say, wholesaler. And um, they were acquiring a, a competitor and they did not need finance. They had the cash to buy the business, the seller was financing the real estate, but they still involved us from, from the beginning. Uh, we consulted with them, we analyzed uh, um, cash flow leverage pre and post acquisition, and most importantly, we helped them with um, uh, evaluating the environmental risk that they were looking at. Um, so with no bank in place, you know, there's no one that's, that's checking environmental. And, um, excuse me, so 
we looked at their uh, phase one, we identified the risks they need to uh, be worried about and help them uh, address them in subsequent due diligence. And that's all without us ever making a loan. So that's sort of the thing that we strive for is um, that type of relationship where it's less of a cashier and more of a uh, consultant. Thank you. Well, I know that many in the community appreciate that community approach. Um, so you talked about great interest hikes, about some bank closures, and so obviously people will you know, be a little worried. What should businesses and people know, and how can they protect themselves? Well, um, everybody knows the FDIC insurance uh, is there, and it covers up to $250,000 in deposits. And, um, on uh, a personal accounts, there are ways to to play around with ownership to increase that, joint accounts, accounts in, held in trust for others. Uh, but businesses don't have that uh, flexibility. So I recommend a belt and suspenders approach. So A, put your money with a safe and sound institution, much like Rock and Trust, that's your belt. Um, B, we have a product which it, it can, um, well it's called ICS. And it's basically, you, we place increments of just under 250000 with other banks that have the FDS insurance coverage, of course. Uh, so uh, you, sit, you we send them around to different banks in our network. Uh, your uh, earning interest, it could be a regular check-in, money market account. So we're putting a little less than two fifty so that you can still earn interest on it and stay within the, the insurance coverage. And then... Um, uh, you're getting one statement, you're getting one online access to all your funds. The funds are totally li uh, liquid. If you want to take them out, tell us before 2.30 p.m. that day, you get it same day. If not, next day. And it's just uh, it's just a good good product and you know, help you sleep at night. Thank you for assuring everyone here about Rockland Trust and your interest in meeting the community needs. We have a pen for you as an expression of our gratitude. So you can sign many checks to folks at one loans. Thank you very much. Now we're pleased to welcome Bridgewater Community and Economic Development Director Bob Ruley. Bob joined the town of Bridgewater in January of 2023. His office is responsible for all land use related matters as well as community and economic development initiatives. He is the primary architect of the town's ambitious revitalizing the heart of Bridgewater vision to reality. Prior to joining the town, um, Bob initiated market to medicom climate resilience and economic development for Warren, Rhode Island, uh, for which he was recognized by the Rhode Island chapter of the American Planning Association with an award of excellence. Bob was also recognized for the 2019 Smart Growth Rhode Island Best Policy Practice Award. His private sector experience includes serving as a consultant to the Department of Navy on privatized military housing and as a regional vice president for private developers of military housing responsible for the renovation or construction of over 9,000 units. His writing has been published numerous times on topics of climate change, sea level rise, Main Street revitalization, historic preservation, economic development, and affordable housing. Please join me in welcoming Bob Ruley. strong suit. Um, so, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Catherine. Best of luck. Uh, if you're here for a typical government employee speech, you are in the wrong building, uh, because that is not me. Um, so, I like to say that Bridgewater's vision of reality is, I don't think there's anything else like it in the country in terms of the holistic approach that we're taking how comprehensive it is in terms of its scope. So these are all the elements of, of what vision to reality is. And you know, my experience in, in government, and I've been in the private sector 
as well is that government tends to look in straight lines and that's really not how we should be looking at it. There's an interconnection between everything that we do. I'm not gonna talk about all of these elements today. I think that you'll see how they do come together, but there are some that, that I do wanna talk about. Um, Chris gave me an hour and 15 minutes and 300 <laughs> slides. So I, I can see him grabbing his heart right now. I got it down to an hour, Chris, don't worry. So many of you are in business and you're familiar with what a SWOT analysis is. And when I've been doing this presentation to residents of different businesses in Bridgewater, we show them maps, we show them a lot of pretty pictures of what we're gonna do. I don't think any of you wanted to see a lot. I have some at the end just because I want to tease you. But I mean, so what this presentation is, is how we have looked at putting vision and reality together and how we approach how we're gonna make this a reality. And when I was, recruited or to come to Bridgewater and my first meetings with with Kimberly Williams our assistant town manager Michael Dutton the town manager was that they were looking to create a model for government that wasn't the typical model of government and my approach has always been that government is a business and we should think like a business so being a contrarian and knowing that I could come someplace and break some eggs I was on board so the way we're looking at this is, again, we're going to identify the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats. So what are the strengths? Strengths are that we have a supportive town council and town administration. Um, I've been here for nine months and six days. Uh, we moved this fall pretty far in a short period of time. Uh, town council in May adopted a resolution supporting what vision and reality is. Uh, there's been a lot of great planning that's happened over the last 15 years. Unfortunately, there was no implementation or execution. So in planning, we like to say there's paralysis by analysis. Uh, we're not doing that anymore. We're not doing any more planning. We're not doing any more studies. And then obviously, uh, we are fortunate that we have Bridgewater State University. Um, they're not going out of business. They're not an automobile plant that's going on strike. They're not moving offshore. Uh, it's a great asset for us to have, and we're going to build on that. But this is just an example of some of the past planning that's been done. And I know the university is in the final stages of updating their strategic plan, which they do on a five-year basis. We like being partners with the university. So we like to say we're a town with the university and a university with a town. What are the weaknesses? This is not unique to, to Bridgewater. I mean, many towns in New England, particularly in the Commonwealth, have outdated zoning. So we don't allow for certain things. We have ridiculous parking requirements. We don't really encourage mixed use. As a result, we've seen a real lack of investment in our central business district, and we have a, a, a real lack of mixed income housing. I don't like the term affordable housing because, and you'll see why in a minute, because most people don't understand what it is. People use workforce housing. I like to use mixed income housing. Uh, and we lack a lot of that in our central district. So I just want to touch on housing for a second because as I said, people don't understand what affordable housing is. These are HUD's definitions and standards, not mine. So you're considered moderate income if you make less than 81, between 81 and 95% of area median income which in Bridgewater is almost $114,000. So if you're an individual making $79,000 or a household of two making $92,000, you're considered moderate income. You're considered low income if you're $63,000, $784,000, almost $73,000 if you're a household of two. That's considered low income. So affordable housing programs start at 80% of area median income. They go down. If you're 10, 20, 30 percent area median income, those projects are really heavily subsidized. But it's that middle tier where there's difficulty people finding housing. So, as an example, if you're a first year teacher in the Bridgewater Raynham School District, you're making $52,000 a year. If you're a teacher with a master's, you're almost at 60, and if you're a police officer, 59. So, I've done presentations, I was on a special task force in. It testified before legislative committee in Rhode Island on affordable housing. People have a stereotype of what they think affordable housing is. I don't think anyone would say, oh, it's a teacher or a police officer, affordable housing. So um, just as a reference point, 
our current housing market, the demographics actually are really strong in, in Bridgewater. In July, in June of this year, average, average list price for a home was $650,000. Average sale price was 682. Average time on the market was 21 days or less. As of August, the rents, the range, uh, the average is 2,075. They range from 1,900 to almost $3,300. We don't have, as I said earlier, a lot of housing available to young professionals. And we hear this from the university that they have a difficult time sometimes attracting professional staff because they can't find housing in this area. And then we don't really have a lot of housing opportunities for 55, people 55 and older that are active, that want to age in place. Um, the opportunity to have more of that housing and free up single family homes for families is something we're very much interested in. The most effective tool, and, and I talk about this a lot, is that you know, people think, you know, if you throw money at housing, you're going to solve the problem. The most effective tool that a municipality has to address the housing issue is through zoning, hands down. Uh, and why more don't do it? I, I don't know. But one of the things that we've been encouraging and one of the things we're doing is changing our zoning. So what are the opportunities? We are an MBH, BTA community. Uh, we're revising our zoning, we're adopting something called a form-based code, and the Bridgewater State University Cybersecurity Program, which I'll talk about some more. So as a MBTA community, by December of 2024, on paper at least, our zoning has to allow for 1,400 units of new housing within a half mile radius of the MBTA platform. Uh, currently, the platform is in the far reaches of the uh, university's campus. Uh, we've initiated, thanks to Michael Lambert and Ray Ledoux, conversations with the MBTA to relocate that platform back to the Spring Street lot. As we redo our zoning, we're anticipating all that. The platform would be moved and the radius would be uh, close to that. Because we have to be in compliance by 2024, it makes it a lot easier for us to make the argument why we need to change our zoning. Uh, Transit-oriented development is something that we want to capitalize on. That's something that's talked about in the MBTA legislation, but that's not rail-specific. We think that there's opportunities, and Mike Lambert and I have talked about this, for intermodal, uh, microtransit. Uh, I think there's opportunities for better regional bus service, and not a criticism of anything they're doing now, but encouraging people to use uh, the buses to go to Brockton, to go to other areas, with New Bedford adding their station on the South Coast Rail, opportunities for people to come to Boston and come to Bridgewater. So we're excited about what those possibilities are. Form-based code, I'm not going to read through this. This is your homework assignment, Google it. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, but one of the things that you know we're doing with this is we're creating more density. And for some people in the community, the D word is a bad word. They don't understand what it is. but you know, we, we just heard about interest rates going up. When we increase density for a property owner, we've created value. So this gives the, the town an opportunity to be at the table with a subsidy, if you would, in creating that value by allowing them to build more and do more than they could previously. Whether that's the amount, the number of stories, the floor area ratio, giving them a relief on dimensional relief, and then mixing uses. A valuable, valuable tool. Now we get to the good part. The cyber program at Bridgewater is, I, I identify that to be our biotech, our biomed. That is our niche, not just for Bridgewater, but for the region. Zero unemployment in that field since 2016, unprecedented. Starting salaries on average, almost $103,000. Coming out of school, bachelor's degree, we're walking into a job making $103,000 a year. Job growth estimated for the next seven years, 33%. It doesn't get better than that, it really doesn't. And you know, that program is gonna do so much for the area. Uh, again, not just Bridgewater, but the whole region. And kudos to Fred and his staff for being out front with that program. So now I get to be a little bit geeky. This is Kinsey in theory. We all know that, right? Good. <laughs> so it's a multiplier effect. Uh, you know, that program is going to increase student enrollment. It's going to create opportunities for postgraduate 
It's going to promote mixed-use development. We think that there's opportunities for businesses that want to be part of that program, that we can create incubator space for private sector to work with faculty, look at how we can monetize that, and then also we're going to see business expansion. So this is, the Kinsey theory is it's the multiplier effect. You're going to increase wages, you're going to bring more people, they're going to spend more money, they're going to go to restaurant stores, and then it multiplies itself. So it's a great thing for the economy, something that we're building on, and really excited to be in partnership with the university with this. So what are the threats? Not unique to Bridgewater, I mean, it's something that is prevalent in the prevalent, I should say, in the uh, southeastern Massachusetts, access to potable water and getting uh, increases to our discharge capacity for wastewater. Infrastructure is, is a critical thing. Um, on the one hand, you know, we have the Healy administration and MBTA communities saying, you know, we need to create more housing, we need to create more housing. We're in agreement with but you need to be able to provide water and sewer for that new housing, and many communities don't have that infrastructure in place yet. Uh, I know Peter Milano's here from the Commonwealth, but just being frank and honest, I mean, we've been trying to have this conversation with the administration since January, because you can't have one without the other. And infrastructure capacity is often overlooked when people talk about housing, and it shouldn't be, because it's just not gonna happen without it. For a town like Bridgewater, we get our water from wells. If we want to increase what our withdrawal is, we have to make a, a permit to DEP. We have to do uh, test wells. I mean, it's a five to 10 year process in order to do that. So we need to get all those at the state level in the same room to understand what some of the challenges are. Just real quickly, we've identified some sites within our central business district uh, that are ripe for uh, redevelopment, that have access to existing infrastructure. Uh, if you're familiar with Bridgewater, the Campus Plaza is kind of the cornerstone of, of what we're reimagining there, uh, a miniature Mashpee Commons, if you would. But that the red dot is where the uh, relocated train platform would be. So you can see that you know, we have some opportunities in the Central Business District. 106 Hale Street is a parcel that is owned by the university. Uh, initially, we thought that had potential for housing. Now, I'm more of the mind that that is the incubator space or that co-working space. Uh, I think there's opportunities with the MBTA further down the road to ground lease a portion of that Spring Street parking lot for housing. It gives the MBTA another revenue source. These are some of the improvements that we're looking at in the Central Square area, if you've ever driven or walked through there. Well, you survived because you're here, but you're lucky here. <laughs> it's a little bit of a challenge. But, and again, these are just conceptual drawings. None of this is planned. You know, we're very careful when we go out to the community to make sure that we're just trying to stimulate conversation. And it's interesting. I'm not a big social media person, but when these things go out, and I read some of the comments on my, my office's Facebook page, you're ruining the town. <laughs> They're going to put a road right down through the central square. I mean, basically what we're doing is taking two lanes and making one and making the sidewalks wider and making more pedestrian improvements. So what's our timeline? This is a 10-year plan that we've consolidated to a five-year plan because I promised Michael and Kimberly I wouldn't retire until this is done, and I'll be 85 by then. Kim. So our process is we have a community workshop on the 26th, uh, where we're gonna ask the community to, okay, here's what we're thinking, what is your reaction, what are your comments, what do you like, what don't you like, what would you like to see? Uh, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, we hope that the proposed zoning amendments uh, will go before the council for a first reading in December, approval in January, uh, will be ahead of what the compliance requirement for MBTA communities is. Uh, that's an advantage for us, for sure. Uh, Infrastructure, we're already in the early stages of looking how we can increase our withdrawal, whether we need to drill some more wells. Uh, we're in that process. We're initiating conversations with the Department of Corrections uh, to redirect the wastewater that we treat for the university to the Department of Corrections and perhaps even bring in some residential neighborhoods in between the two locations. We have a mixed-use project at the Perkins Foundry site, which is across from Campus Plaza. 
that hopefully will get approved by the last quarter of this year. New developments in the form-based code, we expect we'll start to see some of those proposed uh, in the second quarter of next year. And funding, we're always looking for state and federal funding opportunities that's ongoing. And then we'll also be looking at tax increment financing as an option as well. So anybody that knows me, it's all about creating a there there. And that's what we're doing. So I mean, this is just, again, if you've ever been to Campus Plaza, this is how we reimagine what a Campus Plaza could look like. And if you look real hard, you'll see the, the teeth train in the very back. But you know, again, the scale is three, four stories, different types of residential, rental, housing, and ownership, townhouse, condo, local businesses, regional businesses. We're not looking at big box retail is going to come in here. But you're creating a sense of place. Um, and Federal Realty is a national real estate investment trust. We've been in conversations with them. Whether they stay in or not, we don't know. But by, again, changing our zoning, we've created value and opportunity. So I want to thank you. If you haven't been to this website, shame on you. You should go there. Um, it's incredibly comprehensive for a municipality to have a site like this specifically for an initiative. Uh, all the work that we've done is on there. Uh, I do a series of white papers, we call it Let's Talk. I used to call them Bob Talks, then I realized this guy Ted was doing the same thing, so I had to change it. Um, but, so just trying to take the time to explain the different elements of what we're doing. We've got some YouTube videos up there from different presentations. This will probably be up there at some point, and thank you very much. Bob is a small token of our appreciation. I'd like to present you with this pen. And it really worked, a good pen. <laughs> Thank you, Masa, Grant, and Bob. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's program. Um, and, the, and today's program is a business panel. So I'd like to introduce uh, past board chair and president of Bridgewater State University, Craig Clark. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask our panelists to come and take your seats. just about today's panel. Uh, no, but please, everybody be safe. And uh, I, we really have an amazing, truly outstanding set of panelists. And in the interest of time, uh, we're not going to go through every single item of uh, each person's bio. But on your tables, we have their short circuit biography. And I encourage you to just take a look. We really have a, an amazing set of panelists. Um, First on our panel, I want to welcome Brockton Area Transit Administrator, Mike Lambert. Mike, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mike. Next, we have the Mayor of the City of Brockton, Bob Sullivan. Mr. Mayor, thank you for joining us. We also want to welcome to the panel, Max Aller of uh, MPZ Development. Matt, thank you so much for being here as well. We have Peter Milano, Director of Strategy and Business Development of the Massachusetts Office of Business Development. Thank you so much, Peter. And finally, our town manager, Brisbane Town Manager, Michael Dutton. Michael, thank you for being here. As we just heard from Bob, there's so much happening in this town and in this region. We, uh, we, we thought it was a really good idea at the Chamber to highlight some of these developments. So I'm going to start with you, Mike, and I'm hoping for, everybody's got about eight minutes each, and I, I won't cut off your mic because there's only one mic, but try to stay within that if you can. Um, there's a lot going on with transit, transit 
funding for regional, uh, regional priorities related to transit, um, your efforts at BAP. Um, you know, we're hoping to get some insight on timing and impact and capacity for the new commuter rail that's coming, what, the, what impact that'll have on you, uh, and anything else you might want to offer up to the, to the group, Mike. Thank you, President Clark. Uh, I just want to mention I'm joined today by my CFO, Linda Sakeni, and my advancing capital manager, uh, Glenn Gatler. So thank you for them for coming. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to address uh, three different topics today. One is just a general uh, comment on the state of um, transit funding and um, operations across the Commonwealth. The second is an update on South Coast Rail as it, as its launch date approaches. And third is just an overview of the transit opportunities available uh, in the town of Bridgewater itself. Now, and for all those, all three of those topics, there's one overarching and, and unifying message, which is that after three very uncertain and challenging years for our industry, we are suddenly and somewhat remarkably finding ourselves at the edge of a very, um, of the next couple of years that will have um, extensive opportunity um, and optimism uh, driving them. And the reason for that is threefold. Uh, first is state funding. Uh, last fall, the voters passed the Fair Share Amendment to the Constitution, otherwise known as the Millionaire's Tax. And that was designed to provide a new source of revenue uh, for, for transportation and education initiatives. Uh, thankfully, the administration and legislature um, saw fit to allocate a good portion of that new money to regional transit uh, across the state to ensure that um, everyone would have access to night and weekend uh, bus service. Now, thankfully, uh, here in Brockton, we're one of the few transit authorities to already have night and weekend service. So that will allow us to make some uh, more strategic uh, investments in service, um, which will be left up to our boards, so our board chairman, Mayor Sullivan, speak to that um, after I go. Um, the, the second um, thing I want to talk about is um, indication of uh, things improving out, out in our community. And that, for that, we look to ridership. Well, transit is a great industry because it has, it produces so much data which help us make decisions and manage our operations. No single metric is important as ridership counting the number of people that we can get safely around town on a given day. Uh, we lost 80% of our ridership at the height of the pandemic. And that was obviously devastating both for our communities and for our service. Um, but slowly but surely, we have recovered since then. Um, every month recently, we've been setting a new uh, post-quarantine record. And we're now only 15% down from our 2019 uh, numbers. So that's obviously, a, a, this is a sense of encouragement and then when we start adding in service, we should be able to uh, close that gap even further. Um, and then our third um, important contribution is, is of course, federal funding. Um, the administration's infrastructure bill made significant um, swaths of money available to, in competitive grants to help fund the transition to um, electric and other uh, sort of non-diesel um, bus and rail services. Um, that was able to apply for and win a $10.8 million grant to help our transition to an all-electric fleet. Um, for us, it's a no-brainer. Um, electric buses in somewhat temperate climates like this uh, run cleaner, cheaper, and quieter than their diesel counterparts and open the door to renewable energy uh, such as solar canopies to help um, propel our buses. Um, so that's all those elements combining give us a real sense of optimism uh, for the future. Um, in terms of South Coast Rail, um, this is a, a T project, not a bad project, but they are currently estimating um, service start at the end of this calendar year. Um, that will uh, connect Fall River and New Bedford to Boston via Rockland and Bridgewater. Um, there will be five new stations uh, opening at that time, ranging from uh, New Bedford to East Taunton. Um, while the schedule through Bridgewater and Brockton change, um, the T is estimating uh, 1,600 new trips on that line um, every day. And while that number is not necessarily a game changer for either Brockton or Bridgewater, the fact that there's now one seat, will, will be a one seat ride between the South Coast 
um, the Brockton region and Boston um, obviously prevents, presents some real great opportunities for economic development uh, in the region. Uh, finally, just moving on to Bridgewater itself. Um, for a, a town of this size, Bridgewater has really, really strong transit options. Uh, first, um, and most importantly, we have our Bridgewater State University Transit Service. Um, this is a long-standing partnership with, with BAT. Uh, we provide uh, the buses, maintenance, and training. But other than that, the service is almost entirely student-run. Uh, service runs from 7 a.m. till midnight every day. Uh, last year, they moved, um, you know, provided 100,000 trips. Um, and in terms of this, uh, this conversation, one of the important service they, services they provide is a route that connects uh, Brockton and Bridgewater directly. It's open to the public. Uh, runs four round trips a day. We're hoping to get that up to six. Um, but that has proven to be very popular with both students and staff. Um, second is my service that, that provides for seniors and disabled, and those are uh, trips that customers can schedule to connect between Bridgewater and any of the surrounding towns, including Brockton. And then finally, uh, service provided by the town itself. Um, the Council on Aging, and Emily Williams is here. Um, and the council provides traditional council on aging service, which is four days a week, trips within Bridgewater, but is also piloting a new microtransit service, which is imagined sort of Uber and Lyft, but subsidized um, as a public transit service. Um, and so that will that will provide on-demand app-based uh, service for customers. Uh, so stay tuned for more information on that. Feel free to talk to Emma. Um, and that sort of it brings us full circle that. Um, technology um, allows us now to try and offer uh, more flexible service uh, to make up that missing 15% that probably are lost to uh, work from home schedules or other job demographic changes. Um, it allows us to focus on uh, you know, maybe subsidizing Uber and Lyft to address the needs of second and third shift workers that we haven't been able to previously. Um, that is piloting its own microtransit service in the town of Rockland. Um, and so we're hoping to combine the new resources available from both the state and federal government, um, and of course our member communities, with advances in technology um, to try and provide more flexible, targeted service um, across our region, uh, thereby helping support our economy and improve our environment, and of course help people's, uh, improve people's quality of life. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our, oh, oh turn it back to us. Thank you very much. By the way, it's not easy to drive a bus. Uh, Ray Ledoux had a bus rodeo at Bridgewater State. I drove a bus, and I thought the score was based on how many orange cones you knocked over. Very misinformed. But, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. We know that there's tremendous momentum building in the city of Brockton. Um, we want you to talk about that momentum. Brockton really is a center for regional gravity, and what happens in Brockton matters to all of us in this region. And, and perhaps you can talk a little bit about the potential for regional collaboration as well. Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you. I, uh, Governor Romney, I want to thank you for what you did for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, so my name is Bob Sullivan, and I'm so proud to be here today. I want to thank Chris Cooney and his team at the Chamber. I want to thank President Clark and, and Fred's team at Bridgewater State University. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, when I became mayor, it was six weeks before COVID, and uh, my whole mantra was, we're better together. We have to work together. We have to have the eyes on the prize. We're going to get through this pandemic. We're going to have, unfortunately, a lot of uh, sadness and tragedy in Brockton. We lost almost 600 people. But one thing that... Uh, I did was I reached out to the town managers, and, and Mike was one of the first ones that jumped on. We did regional calls. You know, what's working well in Bridgewater? What's working well in Stowe? What's working well in Situ? And what's working well in Brockton? Because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. So I happen to be the mayor of the City of Champions, which is the only city in Plymouth County. But at the end of the day, what we have to do uh, is work together, right? Strategic partnerships. Uh, try to figure out how we can leverage and stack things that are working well in one municipality because the overflow will reap benefits to neighboring communities. That's just a fact. So in Brockton, I'm fortunate to have three commuter stops, right? We have Campello, Montello, and downtown. So Todd, which is what Bob was talking about, transit-oriented de development, 
has been truly a catalyst for investment in the city of Brockton. And I think uh, what's important to, to take away from that is that you have to build upon relationships. Case in point, yesterday, I, I don't know the Secretary of, e of Economics, uh, Yvonne Howe, uh, but I invited her to Brockton yesterday. We did a walking tour. I wanted to show her Brockton. I wanted to show her not what you see on the news, but really on the ground. You know, what, what's there? What are we doing well? What aren't we doing well? What can we uh, work uh, to enhance? Because the economic triple effect is that what is good for Brockton is truly good for Bridgewater. A lot of our kids that live in the city of Brockton go to school at Bridgewater State University. And when I was a little boy, uh, my dad would take us on field trips to Bridgewater. He'd throw us on an old town and country, you know, the old station wagon. Because my dad did not have 300 bucks to go to Stonehill College, but he had $100 to go to Bridgewater State. And so he is a proud bear, and he would take us there. And I, honest to God, thought it was like going to New Hampshire, Maine, you know? <laughs> it really, really was. And I can tell you that what I just saw uh, is something on, on, on the screen uh, is about vision. But it's also about stealing ideas from other municipalities. I went down to Greenville, South Carolina. Someone said to me, go down to Greenville, South Carolina. I didn't know where the hell Greenville was. But I flew down to Greenville because that is supposed to be the optimum downtown in the United States of America, right? And there's 11 ice cream stores there, too, as well, which was good. But what I took away from that is they have public-private partnerships that are truly creating investment. Now, Brockton and Greenville and Bridgewater and Greenville, they're not the same. It's not apples to apples. But the takeaways are that we, as elected officials, have a duty, first of all, to our constituents, right? To the residents, the taxpayers, to the business owners. We want to take care of the ones that are already there. They already have the roots planted. But at the same time, we want to bring new growth in. That's, that's our goal. So in spite of COVID, uh, where other mayors, like my friend, uh, then Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, uh, said pause construction, you have to pause construction. And Brockton, I didn't, because if I did, I'd be 10 years the other way. So if you happen to drive to Brockton now, you'll see a lot of investment in Brockton. And uh, as a kid that grew up in Brockton, you know, I, I knew what a great place it is, right? But Bridgewater is a great place, and East Bridgewater is a great place, and West Bridgewater. And so we have to tell our own story. And so that's why today is an important event, because number one, you have really a great collaborative approach of different professional skill sets. Right, we have the banking industry, the healthcare industry, the educational industry, but they all are thrown into the same pot. You mix them up and figure out what's going to come out of that pot. Right? How do, you, how do you get the stew? What's the secret sauce? Well, the secret sauce is looking at doing a strong analysis of what you have right now. As mayor, as Mike said, I happen to have the honor and privilege to chair the Bath Bus Corporation. So when we get the final uh, funding authorization from MassDOT, one of the things I can do, and I will do, and this is a pledge, and Mike and I have talked about it, is I'll go to the board and I'll say, listen, in the last 50 years, we haven't had bad Sunday morning service. So let's do it, right? And why don't we double our frequencies on Saturday? Let's just do it. Because if we can provide the amenities to help people, number one, it's gonna attract people that, you know, maybe know what Bridgewater is, right? If you live up in the village in Brockton, maybe you're not traveling down to Bridgewater too much, but if you have the capacity to get on a bad bus, number one, it's gonna help congestion with parking in the municipality, but it's also gonna allow people to, to, to experience new things. And I think one thing that I can say, and President Clark mentioned it, is we have great partners in Washington, D.C. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, it, it doesn't matter. But if you go down there and you rattle the cages and you really be persistent as an advocate for the community, you can reap really great financial benefits for your city or town. And I know this firsthand because I happen to know Congressman Lynch. He's an awesome person, right? Growing up in South, he could have been just as easy as growing up in Brockton. But I go down every April to see the big three, as I call them. And it's not Parrish, McHale, and Bird, right? It's, it's Marky, Warren, and Lynch in, in, my, in, in my district. And two years ago, I went down and I said, listen, um, with all due respect, you have additional money. And they said, well, you know, CARES Act and OPERA. I said, no, 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 additional money. They used to call them earmarks. You really can't use that taboo word anymore. And they said, well, what are you talking about, Mayor? And I said, well, there's a pool in Brockton on the east side called the Cosgrove Pool. Okay, and if you're familiar with Brockton, it's on the east side near the fire station. 
It was named after the first Brockton soldier killed in World War II. And I used to lifeguard there in the 80s and, and all that stuff, but that's the beach for a lot of Brocktonians. They, they don't have the ability to go to Cape Cod. They gotta go over to the bridge. And so they said, well, what are you thinking about, man? I said, well, I need millions and millions of dollars to rehab that, repurpose that, reimagine that, make it splash pot, make it family friendly. And you know what Lynch and Markey said to me is they learned how to swim in a municipal pool. And so because I went and I knocked on the door, I got an additional three million bucks, and we're spending three million of the omnibus, which is the earmark money, and then three million from, from, uh, from the opera. And so next summer, the boys and girls and the families of Brockton are gonna have an awesome pool. And I know that doesn't impact Bridgewater, but I tell you this because if we continue to work together with the eyes on the prize, right? And my Nana came from Ireland and she worked in the shoe factories. And what Nana would always, her name was O. Sullivan, and my dad was baptized, they dropped the O. He keeps telling me they dropped it in the holy water, but I don't know what the hell happened. But I say, but I say this, my Nana would always say to me, no matter what, Roll up your sleeves, Bobby, and get the job done. Roll up the sleeves. You're going to have good times and bad times. But if you focus on what you're trying to do, and as mayor, my focus is to help Brockton. Mike's is to help Bridgewater. Mike here is to help back. So let's continue to work together and leverage the, uh, really, the folks in this room and those beyond, because the sky's the limit for the town of Bridgewater, the city of Brockton, Plymouth County, and the Commonwealth. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, again. Now we're going to hear from Matt Zeller uh, in regards to the work that MPZ Development has done in this area. Uh, lessons learned, um, state of the market, and the resources needed to keep the work going. Matt. Thank you, President Clark. Uh, the Chamber for having me here today and the rest of the panel. Um, it's, it's great to learn new things every day, and I appreciate all of this uh, feedback and information. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the work that uh, we're doing in Bridgewater. Uh, again, my name is Matt Zoller, uh, Principal of MPZ Development, and um, I, I made an investment with my partner Jason Korb of Capstone Communities uh, in Bridgewater. Um, going back to September 2017, we uh, responded to an RFP for the McElwain School. Um, so the first thing you should take away from that is time. So it, it's been a while. Uh, and we started the process back then to reimagine what the McElwain School could be uh, in the town of Bridgewater. And um, it took a lot of legwork, um, but I see all of our supporters in the room that actually made that happen. It was the town of Bridgewater that actually embraced what we wanted to do there, uh, which was to create 57 units of mixed income housing um, on about three acres. Uh, we repurposed the McElwain School into 16 units. Uh, we built a brand new uh, passive house, which is the greenest construction that you can do uh, currently, um, largely run on electric. Uh, at the back of the site, that's 38 units, um, and it's the first uh, in Plymouth County um, to, to be certified, FIAS. Uh, and then we also rehabilitated 242 Main Street, which was a three-family home. Uh, all of that came together to create the McElwain School Apartments um, and there was also a large contribution by the town of Bridgewater in the form of a CPA to the tune of $1.3 million. Uh, and that not only helped to restore the school building, create affordable mixed income housing, uh, but also a, a public park. We have a playground, a uh, nature themed playground, and we also have a memorial to uh, the McElwain School in front of the park a memorial. So, um, it's it's a, a culmination of all of the efforts, and um, the only reason that that was really feasible was through the zoning vehicle 40B. Um, baseline zoning didn't allow for what we wanted to do there, and we really needed to figure out the best path. And at the time, that was the best zoning uh, tool that we had in our toolbox. Um, it was also about finding the resources to build a $29 million redevelopment. Uh, housing isn't cheap, and so uh, we worked hard with the community and the state and, and the federal government to subsidize the construction of the McKellen School Apartments. Uh, and that took about three years uh, to pull it all together, and working with the town, uh, again, the first stop was the community, Pre Com Com community Preservation Committee for that infusion of resources to show everybody the town of Bridgewater's commitment to what we wanted to do there. 
Um, we opened earlier this year. Uh, we actually have a ribbon cutting um, on Tuesday of next week. All are welcome, uh, 11 a.m. And we'd love to show off the, the investment that we've made in Bridgewater as a public-private partnership. And we, we couldn't have done it without the collaboration of the, the, the town and um, all of the people that have, had gone to the McKellen School. I mean, the stories that we hear about, you know, growing up in Bridgewater and going to that school are so many, you know, and, and, and we really embrace that and we, we channel it and we, you know, we made the school better because of, of that com connection. Uh, but also, because there's a need. There's a need for mixed income housing, as Bob described in his presentation, um, and it takes a lot of efforts to, to make that happen. Um, so when, I'm supposed to speak a little bit about you know, the demand for housing in Bridgewater. Bob pretty much covered that. I mean, there's an endless demand. You look at, um, we had a wait list of 450 people for our development. Um, you know, 57 families were lucky enough to become uh, residents there. Um, you know, vacancy rates are, are very, very low in Bridgewater. Um, you know, access at Lakeshore is 99% occupied. So just to give you a sense of it, there's a need for housing, an endless, insatiable appetite for it. Um, but it takes a lot of effort to pull it all together. And, you know, because we had 40B as our vehicle to do that project, uh, we were able to build the 57 units, get the density that we needed. Um, but without a zoning tool, um, like 40B or what Bob's uh, proposing for the town, um, you're, you're left nowhere. So it is creating value. Um, there's also other things that you need, and those are resources. Um, construction is expensive. It's more expensive now than it's ever been. In the 20 years that I've been doing this, I, I haven't I've seen construction pricing ever come down. Um, and that's because it's expensive you know, to do these types of things. Um, so, um, you know, but we made it work. We, we found the resources, uh, we, we put in the time, and you know, here we sit in 2023 with a completed beautiful project uh, that the community embraced and through a process that we, um, you know, that we went through with the help of all, all in love. So I think an effort like the one being discussed today uh, really kind of shines a light on what it takes uh, to, to make these things happen. And you know, we've been fortunate for the partnership with the, the town, and, and we continue to look forward to keep keeping on doing that. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. That's remarkable uh, interest in, in the development. So, we have a brand new team in the state house, and they're doing a listening tour. They're setting priorities, and they, Peter Milano will talk to us about the state perspective on priority setting, resources, and how to access all of that. Um, in the next five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, get us back on time, time-wise. Thank you. I'm done. Uh, so I want to thank the team from the chamber for all the work that they did. It, it was really helpful. And um, I truly want to thank Chris who put me right behind the mayor of my favorite city in Plymouth County. Uh, it was, it's always great to, to speak after someone has shall we say, colorful as Mayor Sullivan. People who tend to fall asleep after that, but uh, great, great, uh, enthusiastic, collaborative speech. And quite frankly, my team was part of those collaborative calls, and uh, we, we really appreciated the intel that we got. Mary Waldron, I would be remiss if I didn't say hello to Mary. She's on our board. Um, Mentioning with the Bridgewater State University as great partners, but we also have one of my team members in the house, uh, Alexandra Husted, who is uh, now going to be stepping in to cover this region to assist us. We were fortunate to get a new hire. That's um, everything that has been said here is a very common theme. Um, Governor Haley, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, and my boss, uh, Secretary Yvonne Howe, who uh, Mayor Selvin recently met with. Have, uh, have come in and we, we know that we have a mission now to uh, set a priority economic development wise for the next four years. The team that has come in is energetic. They're willing to do things differently than what has been done. It's not, hey, that's how we've always done it, so we're going to do that. that I think that's probably not going to be the case moving forward. We've been on a, um, 
I wouldn't call it a listening tour, but uh, we've toured the state to meet with stakeholders. We actually did a session right here in Bridgewater. And many of the themes that we heard were very common. Massachusetts is at a true inflection point right now. Uh, there's an extraordinary competition for the talent that institutions like Bridgewater State University are spinning out. And there's a, a lot of states and countries now that are coming after some of the uh, industries that we've built. Life sciences, uh, so at one point it was IT, and now we're very strong leaders in, in green tech, clean tech, and climate uh, mitigation, things of the like, similar to what we just heard in the great presentation from the town. Uh, so Manager Dutton, I want to compliment you on this table right here. They're, um, <laughs> they were, they're very enthusiastic and enjoy what they do, and it's obvious, and that helps for sure. So we have assets in the state. Uh, we, we know that we have uh, more students per capita than any other state, and that is attractive for sure. Uh, and some of the programs that you're seeing are new, and, and it's incumbent upon us to make sure that they stay here. Housing's an issue. We know that. Housing is absolutely a concern. Right now, the latest, I actually, the job numbers dropped today, but I didn't look at them, but the most recent job numbers in Massachusetts were we were at 2.5% unemployment, which is unheard of, quite frankly. I've been doing this for 24 years. The, the lowest we ever got, we matched last month at 2.8%. So the numbers are good if you're a, an employer. I'm sorry, as an employee, but employers are having a more challenging, challenging time. We need to think outside of the box. We have, uh, what me and my team do, my, I work for the Massachusetts Office of Business Development. We're an executive branch agency, and we work with companies, with business partners, and with municipalities to try to assist. Our metrics, what we grade ourselves on, and what we look at are jobs created, jobs retained, in private investment. Uh, very simple, so three, three quick metrics, and it really is something that we can look at and say who's doing better, who's doing worse. One of the ways, excuse me, one of the ways we're covering this region, because we only have 10 people, is that a, a, a program called Regional Economic Development Organizations was created. Several years back, in fact, it was uh, Senator Spilka, who was chair of the Economic Development Committee, who drafted this legislation. And it has actually evolved over years with higher and lower numbers, but we have a redo down here that is extraordinary, and that is the chamber, quite frankly. And uh, we are very fortunate to have boots on the ground here, and when something is of urgent, um, uh, critical in nature, we can send a team member here, but we have Chris and the team here helping us, guiding us, and, uh, and providing us with input. We are always looking to engage. Uh, our secretary, our governor, they, they actually always talk about the sports reference. We want to win. We want to compete. We want to win. We're always going to put ourselves in play, which is great, because quite frankly, we would allow some uh, uh, items in years past to just go because we weren't good at that or we didn't have the ability. Now we're highlighting our assets, Bridgewater State University, our hospital systems in Boston. If you come down here and you look at the labor pool, it is actually, in my opinion, I think that this area has more qualified labor. And that, and that labor is, when it goes to work in these types of jobs, manufacturing, et cetera, those are middle class jobs, those are family wages. It's important to know that, that we can then potentially have home ownership from there. So I do believe that jobs and home ownership lead into a lot of other items in our society and I think it cures a lot of ails. So uh, without getting too deep, I, I do, I leave, um, if you have questions for me, I, I've tried to run around the room and sprinkle my business cards as best I could. But uh, we, we welcome an engagement with any and all the folks in the room. And so I yield back, Mr. President, because uh, I'm trying to help us stay a little bit on time. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to hear from our town manager, vision to reality. It sounds so easy to take a vision to reality, um, but it takes partnerships, it takes collaborations to get that done. And our town manager, Michael. 
Well, thank you, uh, thank you, President Clark. And uh, I would be re remiss as Bridgewater Town Manager if I didn't welcome everybody here to the Old Scotland Links Golf Club. This is a uh, public course. Uh, it's a town-owned course, and uh, there, we have a lot of um, fair number of town employees in the room. Um, and uh, we have a fair number of business owners in the room. But for all the bankers in the room, this is a great place to play golf. <laughs> uh, so, so my thanks to that. Right now, uh, the course is operated by Troon. I think uh, those that are golfers know that Troon uh, really does give you a great product. Uh, Mike Barrett and his team operate the food service uh, at the course, and so if. Uh, if you have enjoyed this meal, it's really thanks to Mike Barrett and the team that, uh, that puts on a great, a great uh, show uh, every time we have events here. So my thanks to them. So the great thing about going last, uh, as Peter alluded to, is that you can say, well, they all said everything I was going to say, so thanks very much. But, I never do that. So, um, so let me just. I felt what I should do is kind of flesh out a little bit what Bob had talked about. Uh, vision to reality is the name that we have given the execution phase uh, after years and years of doing the planning work. And and why why exactly now is it time to execute this vision to reality? Well, I think there are several factors here. A lot of it is. Um, well, really, two, two major um, umbrellas I'll talk about is one, aligning the stars. So when we talked about vision to reality before we had even named it, we talked about, you know, what needs to fall into place for us to be able to execute this plan. The other umbrella is eliminating roadblocks. So government is full of roadblocks. So anybody here that's gone in front of a permitting board, Anybody here that's visited uh, you know, a planning office knows that to expect a lot of roadblocks. So one of the things we've tried to do is start to methodically eliminate some of the roadblocks that are completely unnecessary um, to, to the development world. And as Bob mentioned, we're gonna do that through zoning. Uh, we're gonna do that through some process changes internally. But ultimately, we'll begin to eliminate some of those barriers uh, along the way. When I say align the stars, I started in Bridge Bridgewater uh, almost 11 years ago. Um, I was a lot younger then, in many, many ways. Um, but when I started, uh, the town had just come out of what effectively was the, the public sector version of a bankruptcy. The town had uh, negative free cash, had negative balances essentially in the, on its books. And, uh, and from the day I started, the focus was on improving finances. And I can tell you back then, I had a council that was so open and receptive to thinking of trying to do things differently at that time to improve um, finances. Today, I've got a council that is absolutely dedicated and committed to making vision to reality work. And I can't do this job, and nobody can do this job without a council and a staff, for that matter, who is fully on board and willing to make things happen in Bridgewater. So my thanks to the town council uh, for being on board and, and being with us each step of the way. So. So, so fixing the town finances, making sure that we had the, the political support uh, were, were, was a piece of aligning those stars. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, Mayor talked about it a little bit, but post-COVID, we had, we had some, and I think everybody's recognized that there are two things that came out of, post, uh, came out of COVID. Uh, one was uh, just sort of a renewed sense of energy. Uh, two was a lot of just crazy, crazy people coming in and out of town hall. So, <laughs> so we'll take the good, we'll take, we'll take that post-COVID energy and, and put it to work. Um, and, and quite honestly, some of the COVID, um, you know, our mayor talked about ARPA and CARES funding, that, that was a huge benefit to towns like us. Not, uh, we made the decision very early on, we're not gonna rely on, on CARES money or ARPA money uh, to do things um, uh, that would cause us to have financial difficulties later, we're gonna make sure that we do things uh, with that money that's going to be long-term effect, a positive long-term effect on the town of Bridgewater and hopefully the region. 
So essentially, vision to reality takes all the things that we've aligned the stars, starting to eliminate barriers. Vision to reality takes all the planning that we've done over the last probably 10 to 15 years and says, okay, we know where we need to go. We've got the plans that tell us where we want to go. And now it's time to execute uh, those plans and, and get it done. Um, I, think, I think we also, in this period of time, have, have a great opportunity uh, to create local, state, and federal bridges. Um, I think a lot of times people forget what government is for. Government is not there to tell you no every time you want to do something. Government is there to figure out how to get you to yes. Um, and, and if there's a way to get to yes, we'll get you to yes, but, but a lot of times uh, government is perceived as being, you know, the roadblock. And uh, as I said before, we're trying to eliminate a lot of those roadblocks and make sure that we can get people to yes. I think, um, talk a little bit, I'll flesh out a little bit about what Bob said about the cybersecurity program uh, at BSU. Uh, Vinny DiMasito came to me probably a couple of years ago um, and he said, hey, we're thinking of doing this, uh, this cyber program. And I said, well, what's cyber? Um, and so after he explained it to me, so it's sort of like the blind leading the blind. Vinny, if you were here, would tell you he doesn't, he's not a technology guy. Um, I'm not a technology guy either, so we were a, bit, a little bit of the blind leading the blind. But as, as we went on, we realized that, you know, this is, this is a critical opportunity in a, in, in, in a business um, a business that, that is uh, woefully short of qualified employees. The unemployment rate on Bob's slide, uh, and I'll, I'll mention it again because I really want to drive it home, the, the unemployment rate in the cyber security field is zero. Zero. So we say we have full, uh, full employment in this country when we have 4% unemployment. The unemployment rate in the cyber field is zero. I don't know what that, uh, beyond full employment. Um, so we very quickly decided that, you know, this Bridgewater State University is going to be on the cutting edge of cyber education, cyber security education. We want to be right there with BSU and we want to make sure that we are providing an environment where the graduates uh, of BSU in the cyber security field uh, can very easily transition into either jobs, start new businesses, but whatever it is, stay in the area because that's You've got high income earners, um, and we want to capture high income earners. We want to make sure that they've got a place to live. We want to make sure that they spend their money in Bridgewater or spend their money in the region. Uh, and we want to make sure that they've got outdoor opportunities, recreational opportunities. If, if you're in the cyber field, you're stuck behind a computer. It's your choice. But you're stuck behind a computer you know, probably 10, 12 hours a day. So to be able to provide outdoor opportunities, outdoor recreational opportunities to that um, kind of demographic or those folks is, is critically important to us and I think critically important to the future of the region as well. Um, so I think one of the things the cyber, you know, sort of partnership with BSU has really taught us is that, you know, for generations we didn't have a, a really tight relationship uh, or a partnership with Bridgewater State University. Um, we were a town with a university in it, we weren't a university town. Um, we're beginning to create more internship opportunities within the town to make sure that uh, MPA students, undergraduate students have an opportunity to learn on the ground and firsthand uh, what it is to work in a, in a government. Um, and preferably they stay in their MPA programs and, and continue on with uh, government service. But, it's, uh, but that's, a, that's an important uh, collaboration for us. And I think, um, as uh, you know, and I think Fred, I said it when, when we first met a long time ago, um, the Brid uh, Bridgewater State University succeeds when the town succeeds, and the town succeeds when Bridgewater State University succeeds. So we really are tied together in that respect. I just want to wrap it up by, by talking a little bit about um, what we need to do to make sure that uh, we can uh, succeed in our vision to reality efforts. And I think Bob talked a little bit about um, uh, water and sewer issues, and I want to talk about that a little more in this room because this is, this is the room where uh, the political and the um, practical effort to get things done really comes from. 
you know, we listen to you. You know, we're, we are here to serve, government is here to serve uh, people, business owners, banking, industry, you know, you're all constituents when it comes to uh, really advocating for what is good and right for the, for the region. And uh, water is, is a critical uh, issue uh, in, for us and I think uh, for most cities and towns in eastern Massachusetts. Uh, last year was a great example. Uh, we had a moderate drought last summer and every city and town in the eastern part of Massachusetts uh, was under uh, a lot of pressure uh, to control water usage. And so when you have a moderate drought, can you imagine if we had a multi-year drought where we would be? Um, it is criti it's, a, it's a critical issue that, that we need to address. We need to find additional sources of water. We need to find additional ways to save water uh, so that industry can thrive, so that people can live here, uh, and we can continue to provide the kind of housing that, that the people uh, that we want to retain uh, can use. Um, but I will say, you know, uh, I'm very optimistic. Um, Mary Waldron uh, and OCPC has uh, initiated a, a water uh, study, and, uh, and I think that is sort of the first piece of a regional approach to how water works. If you think about it, we have the four, the four corners of Bridgewater, there's the four corners of Brockton. Um, the water is flowing underneath. It doesn't respect our borders at all which is kind of something I'll have to talk to somebody about. Um, but water really is a regional resource, and I think we have to start thinking about water as a regional uh, resource, same as we have to start talking about how uh, wastewater, how we approach wastewater has got to be a regional uh, discussion as well. And I'm not, not saying that, um, that all of overnight we're going to uh, change our entire approach and, and centuries of practice, but I do think uh, it's a discussion that we need to initiate on how to do things on a more regional basis because it helps us, helps Brockton, helps all the towns uh, around us, and, uh, and ultimately it, it helps the people that we provide services to. So my thanks to Mary and OCPC for, for really getting some grant funding uh, and initiating that, that beginning, and we look forward to that. But, I think so. I've hit, I've hit some of the major points of vision to reality, and, and I'm very excited. Um, I haven't been this excited since my son was born. <laughs> and he's 24 years old. Um, but, but I will, uh, with that, and I, I do thank the other panelists uh, for, for shedding light on, on what, uh, how we can do things on a more regional basis. Uh, but I will turn it back to President Clark. Uh, just while I have the mic put, our cyber security program um, is just about done. We have an undergraduate major, a graduate major, a uh, certificate program, a minor, but we're building right now, it's almost done, the nation's best cyber range, which is really cyber, uh, it's basically a cyber simulator which we will open up to every industry, to any employer in this region to do training on how to escape cyber attacks. We had the number two person from the White House up here for a cyber security forum. And that person said Massachusetts will be at the vanguard of cyber uh, preparedness and Bridgewater will be at the vanguard of Massachusetts. Just one last thing, we were rated at Bridgewater State as one of the state's best colleges or universities last week. We're very proud of that. Uh, by the Wall Street Journal, so you know it has to be right. Uh, we were ahead of Tufts, and I'm telling everybody that. Tufts is not very happy, but... All right, we have just a time for two quick questions. Um, and the first question, the reason I stayed down this end of the table, because I think Michael will probably want to pick it up. If we had additional sewer capacity, what would we want to use it for? Like, which industries or employers would we want to attract with that extra sewer capacity that Bob mentioned is so important? Uh, that's a great question, and I think uh, I think I could water and sewer. Not that they're interchangeable, but water and sewer are sort of the same issue. Um, we need to provide uh, more capacity on both sides of that, uh, and we have to uh, use that uh, additional capacity to provide uh, the appropriate types of housing that, that we want to build to attract quality uh, employees to the area uh, and quality businesses to the area. So. 
So I think most of that, and I think you'll find this is true uh, if, if you study water and sewer issues uh, with any frequency, the vast majority of, of flow um, goes to residential uh, units. And uh, certainly we're looking, as, as uh, Fred mentioned, we're looking at uh, cyber security, you know, kind of hopping on the cyber security bandwagon uh, as, as our biotech um, you know, Boston has biotech, that's all very nice. That's a dying industry. So we're looking at cyber, uh, cyber security and others. I don't want to say we're not looking at other opportunities, but I think, I think drawing clean energy businesses uh, into the region is critically important. We're a sensitive uh, area environmentally, and so, uh, so if we can draw clean businesses, clean energy businesses to this, uh, to this part of, of Massachusetts, um, that, that a lot of that flow will end up going to, to obviously those businesses, but to, to support the housing needs that, that those businesses will give us. Thank you, Michael. Last question, and again, I think I probably have the answers on this end of the table. If, assuming that there's excess capacity of land, no one can write it, Peter, at the state hospital, state correctional facility, if there was excess capacity, could that land be purposed to create housing, especially for a more diverse Workforce is that something that anybody is thinking about? Question from the audience. That's that is actually happening at several uh, former state hospitals and some uh, other uh, parcels of land. Uh, I think one was right down in Taunton, and there's a uh, uh, maybe Belgertown and something in my mind like in Northampton. But um, th those are areas that are using uh, state land to. Uh, and, and DCAM, who uh, surplus his land for the state, has uh, taken an initiative to pre permit some of their properties to accommodate multi-unit multi, uh, housing. So I, I think it's a great idea. It's absolutely in play. Everything's in play. We're about 200,000 units short of what we need to continue our growth. And that's a big number. That's a big number. So uh, you know, you hear about Bob's number, about with the MBTA communities and what can be built. But those numbers are based on what is needed to not just maintain, but potentially grow our headcount or our population. Peter, thank you very much. On behalf of the chamber, we want to give each of you a, a little token. I want you to imagine that we're giving you a gold-plated pen. Now you have to imagine it's gold-plated because it's not. So thank you very much for all of our panelists for everything you've done. Thank you. So as is the custom, each Good Day Metro South, we randomly select a company to be highlighted in our upcoming action report. And the winner is Helen Byrne, YMCA. Fred Chase, Town of Bridgewater. <laughs> Number three, Barrett's gift card and another, another uh, bear. And the winner is um, Dan Lemurieu, the Simply Soul Realty. Number four, Alexandria Taylor, Bluestone Bank. The next bear goes to Laurie Munsey, Only Planning Council. And the final bear is Carla Looney, Looney Realty.
time I'd like to thank a few people that uh, made this program uh, possible. Today's ambassador team, Bridgewater TV Access, Jamie R. Doyle Photography, The Enterprise News, Chamber staff members, and today's sponsor, Rockland Trust. Well, thank you to our speakers. Finally, uh, uh, Grant Nickerson, Rockland Trust, Kambake, Kambake Immigration Law, Bob Rooley, Tom of Bridgewater, Fred Clark, Bridgewater State University, Mike Lambert, Rockland Area Transit Authority, Mayor Robert Sullivan, City of Rockland, Matt Zalo, MPZ Development, Peter Milano, the uh, Bridgewater Panel Manager, and Michael Dutton, Town of uh, Bridgewater, for being with us here today. Okay, great. I, I misspoke there, I'm sorry. Yeah, anyway, that's all we have for today. That concludes our program.